And as usual, I cannot actually bring it up. Okay, everybody. So thanks for joining. Um, get started. So I will uh, go ahead and share my screen. Hope everybody has had a good couple of weeks. A lot of good stuff has been happening. Um, for you who uh, don't know Gaston, uh, he's uh, made some contributions on the data visualization side. It's pretty exciting. So um, uh, pretty welcome him. He's uh, he's uh, from Buenos Aires, and um, uh, and uh, English is not his first language. So um, I just want to be um, uh, deliberate in in speaking to him. But uh, I'm glad that uh, you could join Gaston and and the other members of the project here um, are all scattered from all sorts of different places. Um, and we just had Andre join here from Siberia, who uh, also is, English is not his first language. So we all have. Uh, we, we all have our, our language barriers to, to cross, but uh, it doesn't stop us from getting together and um, collaborating on this project. So welcome, welcome to the meeting. Um, OK, so on my screen here, so for the agenda, all right, I just want to bring everyone's attention to uh, the Get, GitHub milestones as usual. Um, how are things going? I want to put a couple things um, in folks' attention. I have. Um, Consolidated the ion channel and neuropeptide database uh, issues together um, into a single uh, into a single issue. I think that kind of makes sense since they're both related, and, and Tim is helping us with, with both of those. Um, so check that out. Um, we are getting ever closer to this perspectives paper. I was just chatting with Mike and Balash this morning. Um, we, we got to some good consensus um, in our uh, Cambridge meeting, and um, I'm just trying to make sure that that's well reflected in the actual text. Um, so uh, Balash is going to be sending out a draft to a few um, friendly collaborators uh, outside the project uh, tomorrow, um, and I'm going to add uh, a few more things between now and then. So um, hoping that we can just make sure that that consensus is well represented in that, but that is moving forward. Um, let's see, uh, some things are uh, as well. Um, Okay, are there any new ones? Oh, yes, that's right. So I've also added a new milestone here for tuning neurons based on real worm recordings. Um, uh, sorry, sorry. That's OK. So just uh, mute you uh, there. Uh, you can unmute then when you want to talk. OK. Um, so uh, this uh, tuning neurons based on real worm recordings has a couple of issues in here, um, which are dealing with. Um, pulling out calcium signals from MATLAB files that were contributed to us by Andrew Leifer of Princeton. And, and so you can check these out here. Um, I just forwarded a message to the discuss group uh, from Alex, who has uh, succeeded in pulling out what appears to be calcium signals from, from that data. And it's up to us now to have a look at them and, and check them out. So, um, so that's what that is, Mike, to your question. And then we can talk more about it a little bit later. Um, and then, right, okay, so there's a few other issues, but let me deal with them actually on the, on the topic here. Uh, the wiki is moving forward, um, continuing to add some pieces to that. There's not a lot that's new to say right now, unfortunately, but I want to keep that on there. Okay, third update, um, and uh, let me just paste the link again in case uh, folks can get it. I say tuning neurons. Uh, yes, potentially, yes. I mean, have a look at the issue. Uh, Mike, it's it's a proposal to start tuning neurons, but there's a lot that's unclear about what that means. But it would definitely be reusing your your stuff, so that's why I'm bringing it up. Okay, but yeah, have a look at the issue and comment on it, and, and whatever is not clear doesn't make sense. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, hey, uh, hi, Alex. I was just talking about the those issues that uh that I, that I put together there. So it looks like it's a good time for maybe Alex and Mike to to talk again. Okay. Um, back to this though. Uh, so. John White is an awesome guy. Uh, let me switch off, switch back to this. So I had a I had a um, a Skype chat with him, which I turned into a hangout um, on Sunday. And uh, for those of you who don't know who that is, he's the first author on the 1986 paper that was the you know the, that was the publishing of the of the C. elegans connectome, the original C. elegans connectome. He's the first author on it. And um, he's really interesting. And he is really excited about what we are doing, uh, what all of you are doing. And um, he wants to meet you all. 
And so um, we are going to have a journal club style hangout on the 21st of March, um, around the same time we have this meeting. I hope you can all make it. Um, I'll be sending out the invitations to that, um, hopefully in the next day or two. Um, where basically I'll present, you know, as much of the paper as I can. It is 422 pages, so it is uh, not going to be uh, comprehensive. But uh, he will join us, and he will be there to answer questions about uh, how he did it and um, any details you'd like to know, and details about his background. And um, he's very excited. He likes he likes the app, by the way. He's downloaded the app. Uh, you know, he's he's just very supportive of of all this, and he thinks that it's it's reasonable. To, to really pursue this simulation project for C. elegans now, given given all the data that's out there. So he's kind of like a father of the modern connectome, and he believes in what we're doing. So um, I just think it's it's, it's very encouraging, um, and, and I was very excited to get to chat with him. So I look forward to giving you all the opportunity to meet him as well um, on the 21st. Um, OK, so um, analysis of calcium tracers traces from Dr. Leeper. I just talked about that, so I'll skip that. but. You can click here to go right to the milestone that I was just talking about. Uh, synapse position test, right. So, um, so Porig and I wrote this up, um, or you know, came to the conclusion of what this is, uh, what, what the procedure should be to get the initial uh, synapse positions into NeuroML. Um, you should uh, feel free to have a read on this. And, and um, I'm very glad that Stephen contributed this. We've been talking, obviously, about doing this for a really long time. I think this is the first time that we've had you know, eight steps to actually follow to start to get that stuff in there um, that are, I, I hope, pretty concrete. So, um, so this is uh, this is an exciting opportunity. It's going to bridge um, a lot of different things that we've been doing: the NeuroML stuff, the synapse position stuff, and the data collection. So, um, I'm hoping we can make some progress on that here in the next year. So, just a, kind of an advertisement for that issue. Um, okay. And then, um, so visiting uh, UCambridge UCL, that happened in the last couple weeks. And then we had uh, we had a couple of in-person meetings, which uh, if you didn't attend them, um, they were really awesome. And uh, a few awesome things that happened. So we had a community member uh, who was so excited about the project that he came to both of them and uh, gifted the project uh, this. Uh, which we did not know uh, he was going to make in advance, um, and wasn't it wasn't a gift really to me personally, but I just ended up with it. Um, but but uh, as you can see, it's a lighter, and they've uh, they've got the open worm logo on there, which is just like we were like, what? <laughs> like that was really surprising. So the story that there is that this is a guy named uh, Eugenio Battaglia, um, and he's also writing up a blog post on kind of the history of the project. Um, I talked with him earlier this week, uh, just to give him all the details about how this has come together, um, and he's looking to write that up. Thanks for hearing. So he's looking to write that up in a couple weeks or so. Um, but he's obviously very enthusiastic as well about, about the project, so I thought I'd that with him. Um, okay, and then, uh, yeah, also, uh, if you go to the Google Plus page for OpenWorm, you'll see some pictures of uh, that get together. Uh, there was a lot of energy in the room. Uh, it was very exciting. A lot of new folks learning about the project. Uh, we got to meet some of the folks that have been um, you know, collaborators, like Jim Lacey, for example, who you've seen on the list, uh, was there. And so a lot of really good energy in the room uh, in some of the London meetings. Uh, does anybody want to say anything about that as well, who was there? Um, I'm not the only one who was there. Comment on those meetings? Well, I'm, I was pretty happy about the fact that we met in person, just because other than being a rare occurrence, we just we, we actually did a lot of work, like open worm work. So everybody was doing, working on something, and we, we made a lot of progress on a number of things. In particular, one of the things was uh, the paper, like the perspectives paper, uh, Balazs, Stephen worked a lot on, and then did everybody contributed. So we had then we like some somebody was working on scripts to facilitate the installation of the simulation engine. Somebody else, uh, myself and Mike, oh, the first day we spent working on the PCI SPH porting and actually solved a number of issues. 
Um, so like, it was productive. So we should do it more often. Um, anybody else? All right, let me let me keep going then, so we can get to uh, individual updates. Um, so, last uh, last thing is on data visualization progress. And so here I'm going to report uh, some progress from uh, other folks. So as you know, we've been we've had some issues up uh, for data visualization over the last several weeks, and we've actually gotten some really nice contributions. This is where Gaston comes in. For those of you who just joined late, Gaston is uh, is a contributor from Buenos Aires. Um, really appreciate his help. He's actually a student, and um, he's been learning Python in order to make a contribution to the project. So, um, so it's it's really exciting actually that this is uh, some of his first programming projects are really um, that I'm going to show you here. So, um, if you guys can see my screen, this uh, is uh, actually a, a D3 JS rendering of um, all three neurons. Um, in the C elegans, um, and uh, basically, uh, if you click into one of these, okay, you're going to get some details on what that on what's going on with that neuron. So, basically, um, the uh, the label here VD8 is the name of the cell, and then um, if it's associated with uh, a GABA receptor, that's here. If it's associated with another receptor like NPR1, that's over here, and uh, you can click through each of these basically and see. Uh, into the details of, of what's going on. Now, right now, a lot of these are NPR1 and GABA. Uh, there are some that have other things in there. Uh, we'll need to break them up a little bit. Because, so here's glutamate, and then this one says none. Um, there are some other um, are some other things here where, like, they're they're grouped together. So a bunch of different um, expression patterns are are in here. The idea of this is ultimately to have, you know, I think more bubbles and boxes in here, one for each of these things, to be able to click in and get a sense of them. But um, but the the purpose of this is to have a single at a glance view of uh, all of the different uh, you know neurons inside inside the system. So for a first programming project and for being able to like work with actual biological data, um, this is I think awesome for the force of uh, you know integrating Python script, with JavaScript. With Library and all this stuff, all the while, like only communicating basically over email uh, with me. So, um, so Gaston, I think this is a really great start, and we're going to take this and go even further with it. But I just wanted to give everybody a chance to have a look um, and, uh, and celebrate the fact that you uh, hit this milestone. So, uh, thank you for that. <laughs> Thanks. Good. All right. Um, another thing that got done here in this, and we're going to keep evolving that, um, is uh, another data project that uh, actually a collaborator coming from Sao Paulo has contributed. So Latin America is being well represented here in our, in our data visualization project. Um, and that's this. And I think you guys are going to find this pretty interesting, too. So um, uh, you may have seen this issue on the, on the board before. This is a hive plot. Um, uh, as you may know from you know several of the images that you've seen in the past, um, representing a, a complex network like the C. elegans connectome tends to lead to these kind of hairball pictures where there's a lot of links and nodes and they're all over the place. And, it, and frankly, the challenge has been that it's really hard to get a lot of insight into what they need. So the Hive plot is a visualization that's been around for only a few years for folks who are un unhappy with the state of hairballs. I tried to make a way to visualize uh, complex networks that lead to some insight. And um, so I, I saw this, and I made up a link. Uh, yes, um, let me link you to uh, where this is actually created. Um, and uh, it actually has all of the links out from there. Um, this is the issue that uh, we're talking about here. Okay, issue 39, yeah. So you'll, you'll be able to look into more of it. but. Um, uh, I'll walk you through and explain what, what it actually means here. Um, so um, it's surprising to me that nobody has done, has applied high plots to connectomes or neuroscience at all as far as I've been able to tell. Um, and it, it occurred to me that it would be a good thing to do. 
And this is a first shot, and, and we haven't fully validated this yet, so um, take this somewhat with a grain of salt. But I think, um, but given what I've seen in, this, in the script that was written, um, this looks pretty close to accurate. So uh, here's, what this is, here's what this means, okay? So um, every node that you see here is a node in the neural network of C. elegans. So, um, but they're only represented once. So, um, uh, so, th so this is 302 nodes between these three axes. So um, something will appear on one of the axes um, depending on some criteria. In this case, uh, motor neurons are on the A3 node, sensory neurons are on the A2 node, and the A1 node is all the internet. Okay? So um, a neuron only appears once, it appears on one of these three axes depending on whether it's motor neuron, sensory neuron, or internet. All right, now they're connected together based on if the uh, connectome graph says that uh, there's a connection between all of them. So this motor neuron projects to this interneuron, and it projects to the sensory neuron, and all in the case. You can see that there's a, a lot of different connections of flowing between them. Now, the ordering along this axis is particularly interesting, and particularly interesting in this, in this plot. So the way they do it, and there's many ways to make a high plot, but this is one of the common ones, is that uh, you can think of this axis as going from 0 to um, some big number, where the, the big number is the maximum uh, degree of the node. Now, what the degree means is the number of edges that go into that node or out of that node. Okay, so, um, so as an example, if you don't get any uh, connections at all, uh, you are in towards the center of this, and so your, the position of the node is going to be towards the center. If you receive a lot of connections, you're going to be out towards the end. If you receive the most number of connections of any node in your whole graph, you're going to be out here towards the end. Okay? So, uh, in this graph, what's interesting is, for my money, is these four nodes here. Okay. So if if this doesn't if this doesn't turn out to be some sort of an artifact uh, in in the way that the script is written, um, what this is saying is that um, of the interneurons in the C. elegans connectome. There are four interneurons whose connections to other cells in uh, in the network are so uh, dense that they stand essentially heads and shoulders above not only all the other interneurons but all the other motor and sensory neurons. Okay, I was expecting much more smooth, uh, you know, uh, change between these, right? So, but what this is saying is that th these gaps here between these neurons are saying that. It's not just like a linear difference in, um, in the number of connections between these interneurons. It's actually a full like step up of change in degree between the connections that you'd see in these four neurons and the ones in all the rest down here, where it's much more smooth. How many uh, connections they get? Steven, uh, what's the name of the two neurons at the top? Good question. I've asked. Uh, I've asked, so I don't know. I've asked the uh, the contributor who's uh, put this together to tell me what they are. Um, I've, I um, I invite you to guess. Um, my guess is that these are AVAL, AVAR, and ABBL, AVBR, uh, which are the demand interneurons, supposedly, um, and have been implicated as being highly connected hubs. But um, I'm speaking with uh, this collaborator uh, tomorrow. And uh, he's going to tell me, but I asked him to add labels to this as well, um, so we're going to see. But uh, yeah, good question, right? That's super interesting. It's super interesting to yeah, because we can cross-check it with the visualizer on open source break just to yeah. see. If it... Yes, 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 exactly. So um, now, uh, just to take this one step further, uh, and then I'll uh, we, should, we should go on to, to updates. But the last update is this one here. So um, this is a similar graph, but let me explain why it's different. So um, again, motor neurons are on this axis, sensory neurons are on this axis, okay, and interneurons now are duplicated. These two axes are uh, have the identical set of nodes, so they're both uh, the interneurons. They're both reproduced. So in this case, it, it, an interneuron may uh, appears here, and its duplicate is here. But the difference is that this axis is going to show the edges of um, where the interneuron is sending connections out only, not receiving them. And this axis shows edges where 
it's only receiving, uh, you know, uh, incoming edges uh, and not sending them out. Okay, so you can see again. Uh, oh yeah, and the last thing is that you'll notice that the uh, axes are more dense, uh, so they so like the motor neurons stretch all the way out. So here um, the axes are normalized. Okay, so whereas over here, right, motor and sensory are all bunched together because um, all three axes are operating on the same maximum, which is the maximum of this. Here, they're exploded out so that uh, each axis independently is allowed to uh, find its own maximum and, and spread out um, amongst them. So you can see more of the edge detail here. And, um, you know, it, it, you know, it kind of looks the same incoming and outgoing between the two inner neurons, although you can kind of see, for example, here, there's a lot more dense connections that are outgoing from the inner neurons to the motor neurons than there are incoming from the sensory neurons. But um, anyway, the idea of hive plots is that you, you can plot the same, like we could take the network of, of some other organism and plot them in the same way of motor neuron, sensory neuron, and inner neuron. In theory, if you had the connectome of the whole brain, for example, of a mammal, uh, you could plot them exactly the same way and you would see, you know, if if there are also highly connected interneurons in the human brain or not. So that's why people like hive plots because they have this comparability on aspect. So anyway, so stay tuned to see if this is not, you know, fake. Um, I hope it isn't fake because it's really exciting and I hope it's not just like a bug in the code that leads to that. Um, if it holds up, uh, I think it's genuinely, uh, you know, a contribution um, of the project because I don't think anyone has, I mean, it's never been clear to me that there's been some interneuron that just stands like crazily ahead of all the other interneurons. So we'll have to double check. All right, any questions about that? Hey, who's the other contributor who made that? Uh, his name is Pedro. Uh, he just uh, he just emailed us, like, last week. So, uh, yeah. So I haven't even, I haven't even had a conversation with him. Okay. Let's keep going. So, um, Jorge, you are up. Yep. Okay, I think I heard you briefly. He might be having problems with uh, his new computer. Okay. Um, all right. So okay. Here. Hello. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. Thank you. Yep. Go for it. Uh, did you ask something? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, looking uh, for your <laughs> update. Um, yeah. There's a lot of good updates from you uh, over the last uh, last couple of weeks. I've yeah. seen several issues, so I just wanted to give you a chance to talk about it. Yeah. I, I'm working on uh, bugs of SPH. Uh, that's all. <laughs> Uh, now this box was fixed and uh, I'll see uh, to work I want to work uh, with Giovanni uh, with Sporting and uh, to work on generator of configuration and uh, so that's all I think and paper maybe yeah, that's right. That's right. That's that is the other thing um, is the piece of SPH paper. But yeah, I just wanted to give you, uh, you know, stand standing ovation for um, closing these two bugs, which have been, um, you know, troubling us, uh, you know, for a while. So um, just want to put them up on the screen and say uh, how awesome this is. Okay, good. Let's keep going. Giovanni, you got some good stuff to report too. Yeah, so related to that. Okay, so basically, um, as, as Sergey and Andre are fixing bugs on the C++ version, I am making sure that that code makes it into the Java version. So it's basically every day 
as their closing bugs, I, I basically port that code into Java. It's it's getting to the point that it's really, I mean, the, the C++ version looks like it's really tight. The Java version is still not working properly, and uh, today, ju right before this meeting, and that's why we were late, I was in an hangout with Sergey, and we're just trying to find out what's wrong, and basically, we are at the point that the porting is basically finished. I don't see any differences in the code itself. I, I look at it, it's like the same stuff, one, like in a different uh, source. But uh, basically, Sergey uh, offered to help with it. And I was basically walking him through the stuff. And uh, I'm hoping that he works his magic, same as he did for the C++ version. Um, so yeah, we have a few tests with, with scenes for the Java version of this, uh, PCI SPH. So that should make it easier to, to work on it. There's no need to set up uh, web servers or anything. You just run the unit tests. So, and some some bits and pieces of refactoring along the way. So, like, you, if you want to, uh, like, if you know details about exactly what has been done, it's easier just to look at the at the activity on GitHub. And you can just pick change sets and see what changes and stuff. But basically. All my time is basically spent on the porting, and it's to the point that it's finished, but it doesn't work yet the way that it should. And another thing that it's not there yet is the elastic metal stuff, just because that's uh, going to be much easier once Sergey does the scene generator, um, so that basically I can just look at that and generate the scene the same way. Uh, also, wrote a bunch of code to transform scenes from our format, um, which is like not our format, from the XML format to the text fi uh, file format that Sergey and Andre are using. So now we, we can run the same scenes on the two versions of the of, of the PCI SPH implementation. So that helps as well. And um, other than that, not much. I. Doing Twitter stuff for Open Worm. You've probably seen that question about the longest neuron. I replied to that. Thanks to Tim and Chris for pitching in. And that's pretty much everything from me. Joe, have we tried, have we tried with Sergey in this past hour to run the File that we generate uh, in the C++ version. You tried it. It did that, and it works. It works. Yes. Okay. So there's something. Diff so basically, we run the same scene in the Java version and in the C++ version, and in the C++ version it works, while the Java version doesn't, which means there's something wrong, and uh, we just need to look for it. There's no two ways around it. So, is the uh, the issue here that I'm uh, that I've got up on the screen uh, number sixty five, which I'm also linking to? Um, is this is this part of what you're working on as well, or uh, not yet? Or no, I, I'm not on that yet. No, okay. this is this is uh, one of the next steps. Okay. All right, cool. Um, very good. Let's go to Mike. Hello. Okay, so um, <clears throat> since the meeting, the things I've worked on have been, um, I did some work, unfortunately it was not successful in uh, trying to get Geppetto installed on my machine. Um, under Linux, um, I wrote quite a bit about the problems I was facing. Unfortunately, I've, uh, I've kind of given up for the time being. Um, Good news. Uh, uh, good news. On the other hand, is that I've now released a uh, latest stable version of libneuroml. So that's a Python API for modifying neuroml documents. And I've got some strong incentive to keep it maintained and documented, etc., because it's being used by the CatMade project in at the 
Max Planck Institute in Berlin, I think. Um, so yeah, so those are the two things I've been working on. So hopefully with LibNeuroML, the muscle cell model, I can now write in, write for pyramidal, and we can automatically have nice NeuroML documents produced for muscle cell models um, as we produce and modify them, etc. And hopefully, obviously, LibNeuroML can be used in the project for other reasons too. That's it for me this week. Okay, awesome. Um, let's keep going, Mateo. Uh, so yes, just elaborate a bit on uh, what Mike was saying with the problem. Mike, the uh, issue that you hit with the Ubuntu neural machine was the segmentation fault uh, for OpenCL, right? Okay, yep. and uh, uh, just to give a bit more more context for other people, this is an issue that we are. Uh, that we're seeing with uh, Ubuntu and uh, uh, OpenCL bar JavaCL, and we've seen it not only on Mike's machine, but also on Porig's machine, which also uses Ubuntu, and Jim Lacy's Ubuntu machine. Now, I emailed and I pinged him uh, yesterday, the um, guy that was also at the Open World meeting, uh, Olivier Shafik, who's uh, kindly uh, offering to help us finding the problem. Basically, the problem is in OpenCL during some sort of initialization, and uh, he he has he's having trouble now with his own machine. He's waiting for some parts, uh, and he said that by the end of the week uh, he should be able to basically try and reproduce that issue that we're having. So hopefully next week we'll hear more from that. Yep. I'm really looking forward to this issue uh, being becoming getting resolved because obviously I'd like to help Giovanni and uh, one thing I've been doing this week which uh, which I didn't actually mention and I realize is I've been learning about SPH and having a look at the C++ code so once Geppetto is working on my machine um, we can double double the workforce working on the and keep Giovanni some company as well in his with his SPH troubles. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to this being resolved. I'm yeah, sure I'm so. sure I'm sure it'll be fixed. I just yeah. hope it's really soon. Yeah, yeah and so. I just uh, I just linked to the to the issue there, number sixty four. And uh, it's here. Uh, at, uh, the table back, so keep your eye on this issue. <laughs> okay. And uh, the other thing that I'm working on is the um, wrapping of JLAMs for Geppetto, which is um, becoming, like, uh, I created the, the wrapper for Geppetto, uh, uh, I believe, two weeks ago, but in order to start, and I started writing some tests against it, but in order to use it, I am um, adding uh, an API on top of JLAMs itself, so, uh, and, and I'm doing this with, um, with Robert, Canon, who's the original developer, and so that we basically do have a, a sort of a layer that we can use to interact, uh, and Jabet will be using this layer once uh, through the through the wrapping. So that is what I'm doing at the moment, and basically, uh, as soon as that is finished, uh, we'll be able to probably replace uh, at the very least the kind of proof of concept. Uh, Neural simulator that we have uh, with uh, with one based on JLAMs. It won't use GPU, but it will uh, read NeuroML uh, single compartment NeuroML, and so it, it will be easy to configure it, and it, it won't be anymore an encoded uh, version of a specific type of neural. So that's what I'm doing. Very good. Should we go on to Andre? Maybe not. Andre, I, I think I see your lips moving, but I don't hear you. I don't know if your microphone is on. Oh, 
All right, we'll give you we'll give you a second to figure out the uh, microphone issues. Um, uh, can you yeah. hear me? Yep. Yep. Yes. Oh, great. Uh, well, the last two weeks uh, was um, quite resultative. Um, I can mention uh, a number of fixed uh, issues. Issues. I put a link uh, to what was done. Uh, if somebody would like to watch it in details, and I can mention briefly that uh, me and Sergey uh, were um, handling with um, uh, SPH algorithm bugs. Uh, not serious. It was working, but um, they have fundamental sense uh, for stability, st stable work of uh, all the simulator. Uh, well, the most important was uh, the bug with uh, indeterminism. Uh, the same initial uh, sin uh, produced uh, different uh, coordinates after a few uh, hundreds of iterations. Uh, as we all know, uh, so, first, uh, I have found the source and fixed the bug for the sin, uh, which um, consists um, completely from uh, liquid particles. Um, so, that was a success. Uh, the bug was fixed, everything worked. But uh, after this, we found out uh, that um, if elastic matter particles are present in the sun, uh, they again uh, produce uh, another kind of um, indeterminism. Uh, and, um, well, it was easier to find the source with uh, experience uh, recently received <laughs> in this field. Uh, so, Sergei found this um, new source of error and fixed it. Uh, this was the most important uh, thing. And then, um, well, uh, next commits uh, from me um, contain fixing of other features which were inconvenient and became uh, quite user friendly. So now we do not depend from, um, we, do, we do not need to synchronize a uh, number of particles uh, which uh, we are going to load from file and uh, which is um, defined in uh, source files uh, when we are building the project. Uh, so now we don't need to define anything, anything in source files. Uh, the program determines this number um, when loading the files and uh, allocates enough memory. That's quite uh, convenient and it should work like this from the very beginning. There are always reasons um, to fix something more important than this. Well, and finally, um, the we needed to use a um, number of particles uh, of some really like uh, 256 or 188 or other degrees of 2. Um, so if we needed uh, more particles, uh, we need to make in another additional liquid particles to get necessary number. Uh, now we can use uh, any number of particles we would like. So again, uh, the file contains uh, initial same uh, particle coordinates. Uh, their number can be any. Uh, no limitations. Now it works. And we are going we planned another um, improvements for the next period. More uh, convenience of work 
with the code, with the simulation engine, and uh, fundamental uh, issues like uh, universal convenient file format, um, which is, is read by a machine and by a human, uh, and um, some kind of automatization uh, to generate initial uh, structures, uh, initial scenes uh, of um, a particle three dimensional configurations. Um, so we are going to generate them automatically where possible um, with the ability to make it in different utilization. Uh, so for example, uh, one muscle cell uh, can be represented with uh, hundreds of particles and with uh, thousands of particles. Um, the same uh, linear size, but particles can correspond to different, and represent different uh, amount of uh, three-dimensional space. For example, a particle might have a weight of one milligram uh, and have one radius. Uh, or can represent uh, 10 milligrams uh, and um, have a larger radius, but in this case we will need less particles and um, we will need less computational power to simulate this, but we will lose uh, uh, the precision. That's all for now. Thanks. Andre, yes. Can I ask you a question? Uh, yes, sure. Thanks to all the very good things that you uh, did with Sergey in the last uh, week. I think we have a very good opportunity now because we basically have the C plus plus version that not only uh, became deterministic but also started reading uh, external input files. Now. I think the good opportunity is for us to add some tests on top of it. So basically, if we know that after a given number of steps, an external configuration always produces the same position and velocities for all the particles, we could print those to a file and then use that as a reference also for the Java porting. Basically, we would know that given this 10 set of particles, we let the system evolve for 100 steps, and then the position and the velocity for all of those particles is this one. Then that same file, we could feed it in the Java implementation that we have, so that we would make sure that the result that we obtain on the Java version will be exactly the same ones that you are looking at the C++ version. But regardless, the benefit for the Java version, I think it would also be useful in the future so that if you will be making any changes, fixing any other bugs, or adding any other feature, you will still know that whatever result you reached so far would still be working. So you would know that you are not breaking, for instance, the evolution that you are happy with at the moment. Do you think, and it's a question for both you and Sergey, this is something that could be done? Oh, thanks, Matteo. A very good question. Well, I have uh, an opportunity to test um, this um, on two different machines, but uh, both of them uh, are running on Intel uh, processors. Uh, yes, here we get uh, absolutely identical uh, results after fixed number of steps. Um, but well, uh, I still have not compared uh, the same. For example, when we are running uh, one run on uh, CPU and one run, run on GPU. Um, possibly uh, the um, representation of, for example, uh, float data type 
can work uh, slightly different uh, on at least different types of uh, processing uh, units. Maybe, maybe uh, there will really be minor uh, differences, which after hundreds of steps uh, can lead to um, significant uh, changes in coordinates. Right now, I'm not sure, but uh, first, to answer your question, I should check, please. Uh, so it will be still deterministic, it will be still okay, but um, well, right now I'm not sure. Uh, I, I think, uh, I, I see what you're saying, different, uh, uh, basically, hardware can produce potentially, even if the algorithm itself doesn't have any problem, could potentially produce minor differences in the result. Uh, but I think what would be interesting would be still to have this mechanism in place so that uh, in order even to check if different hardware would produce different results, it would be just a matter of, ru of running the test. So the test that is passing, for instance, on your two machines that use the Intel CPU could run in another machine that uses OpenCL and we would be able to tell whether the different hardware is causing a difference or not. And that would be a way to test it in a sort of, in an easy way across different machines and hardware producers. So it would be another thing that it would be useful for. Okay. And on uh, every type of uh, processor, CPU or GPU, uh, of course, uh, if we are running on the same device, uh, now we should uh, receive identi identical uh, results uh, on every run on the same uh, type of device. Okay, seems reasonable. Um, if uh, if we're good to, to move on, let's uh, just touch base with the last couple folks here. So, Alex, um, this is the update I had from last time, um, and um, and then of course we've met here in the last uh, week. So, do you want to just uh, report what you've been working on? Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, you're really quiet. You're super, super quiet. No, I can see you fine, and I can hear you like really quietly. But uh, it's like the microphone volume is turned way down. No, so quiet. No. Aha! There you go. That's okay. the one. Yeah. Uh, did you show the chart I sent you? Yes, so let's show that. Uh, I, so I, I've sent it out via the discuss list, but uh, let me bring it up here as well. Um, why don't you go ahead and explain what it is while I'm, bring, while I'm getting it up. Do you want to just explain what it is while I'm bringing it up? Uh, yeah, so basically, uh, this is the intensity level from the experiment video which we have. Uh, so this is the AVA neuron, and the intensity level from uh, green and red channels. Basically, both plots are almost identical, uh, except the, the pike here. As you can see, between 1,500 and 2,000, so you definitely will switch between them. You can see that. Yep. But can you switch between the graph? Uh, I can see it. Uh, if folks click right on my um, on my window, they'll see it permanently. Uh, and then um, this is the other one. Yeah. So they are pretty pretty similar. Alex, 
<coughs> Sorry to interrupt you. I just oh, asked yeah. a question. Could, could you tell? Can, could you tell us what the axes are? What are we seeing here exactly? Uh, so I wasn't paying attention. Yeah, sure. Uh, so the the x axis is the time frame. Basically, it's the the actual frame from a video. And the y axis is the intensity level of a neural. I can't tell you what is the scale there because uh, I simply don't know. I parsed the the meta file. Yeah, I think it's some sort of pixel intensity um, value, basically based on um, you know this calcium recording, which of course you know has its has some methodological caveats in terms of the, the relationship between the pixel value and the actual calcium uh, intensity inside the cell, but uh, that's what the readout that's what the readout is, and. Um, uh, yeah. Let me pull up the movie again, uh, which you should only watch for a little bit. But, uh, let me just grab that. Anyway, do you, are there other questions while I'm getting that? Vlad, how did uh, you extract the values from the movie? Uh, not from the movie, actually. Uh, it was in a supporting MATLAB file. Ah. Yeah, so I'm working with movies, but still it's not a success. Uh, actually, my question is whether this picture, this plot, looks uh, believable. I mean, does it seem like a neural activity? Well... Big question for everybody, actually. Yeah. I mean, so one thing to note is that this is not the same as the voltage signal, so if, if you expect to see <clears throat> action potential like spikes with the characteristic action potential shape um, you're not going to see them in here unfortunately um, instead the calcium signal is a much more uh, slow time scale signal that comes out um, so that's kind of my way of saying that like well we don't you know it's it's hard to compare really um, uh, but it looks like it could it looks like a reasonable calcium signal in terms of in terms of that much yeah. yeah. That's what it looks like to me. I mean, it's hard to say, right? But it doesn't look unbelievable. So this is the um, this is this is the movie, and um, uh, my understanding is that this is parsed out of essentially looking from at this little circle here. Um, I'm just kind of clicking around, um, and that it's the brightness or intensity value maybe coming from out of this this particular circle um, in a channel or two. So I don't know why that circle is exactly the place to measure from. Um, we can sort of ask those methodological questions, but um, that's where the data are coming from for those of you who hadn't seen that before. And the light coming out, this is a calcium camera, correct? It is a, it is, well, uh, let's see. So there's two okay. channels, there's a red and a green channel, and our understanding is that they are both able to see the intensity of the calcium signal, uh, I don't know exactly what fluorophore was being used. So actually, should... I can I can cite the uh, email from Andrew. Yes. Uh, that's what right. So you read subfields are intensity values the AVA neuron in the red and green channels for each right. Okay, M cherry and G camp three. Right. So green is the G camp three. The question, of course, is why why are they both look like their activity patterns? Uh, even though one should just be, I, I, don't, I don't think the M cherry should actually have any dynamics in it, um, because it would just be static. Um, so M, M cherry is a marker that you tag like a given neuron with, but then doesn't show you any of the activity. Uh, whereas GCAM3 is the actual calcium sensor there. Because um, the muscle, it looks like the muscles are <coughs> light, lighting up as they contract, which to me says calcium camera. But. Well, it's, it's, so the calcium sensor should be in the AVA neuron, not in the muscle. So to be clear, this is... Okay. Yeah, so this is a neuronal thing, not a muscle thing. Ideally, we want muscle stuff, but this is the first thing they gave us, so... Well, yeah, yes and no. We're just trying to parse that out. So anyway, we should probably table this for another another session. But I think maybe Alex and Mike, the three of us, should get together on this. Uh, 
and uh, and parse through it, or at least just uh, follow up here on the on email. Um, so we can keep the ball rolling. But that's awesome. That's awesome work just to pull that out and see that we're actually working with data set now. Uh, way. Alex, were you also working with uh, optimal neuron in this period? Uh, not this week. No. So that's from last time. So very cool. All right, uh, and Tim. Hey. Okay, so um, let me jump around a little bit here. So I, I've been working on uh, setting up, uh, as I showed last time, we had a meeting the brain um, tool, and a after a bit of frustration in trying to copy data from the spreadsheet back to the data in the brain. I um, decided that look, I, the best the best way to handle this is just create a database with all these elements and cross-reference them. Because the bottom line is, is that it, it the spreadsheet that we have is great as far as information, but it's it's, it's impossible to pull data out of it uh, specifically. So you have several exons, you have several neural peptides, you have neural transmitters, neural receptors. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm taking each neuron and breaking those elements down uh, so that we can have some data that expresses each individual neuron and, and the components that make it up. And then I'm using MS SQL 2012, but we can, we, we can then take that data and export it to any format we want. And I think that will help um, along the way quite a bit. Then I started, I started playing around with the Steve Cook data, and um, I created a, a neural on neural project in Neural Construct. Uh, but my question is, do we have a representation of uh, MDL08 out there? Uh, I wish Mark was on here, because he will, uh, you know, he would remind us. So we did, we did have that, and... Um, I thought we did, but yeah, I couldn't yeah. find it. Yeah, so he, you know, I think he consolidated the projects together into a single one so that it's not that it's a separate project, but it's um, NeuroConstruct lets you do these configurations. So it's the same NeuroConstruct project, but you could get a different uh, group of cells to show up under that configuration. So uh, my understanding was that he made that a configuration with that had the muscle cell in there. But I think um, we should well, send it down on the list uh, 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 to find it rather than making it again. Okay, well, I pulled down what he had up on GitHub was the last update, but the, the thing is he had a test muscle cell in there, in that, yeah. in that neural one now, but it really, there's nothing that shows up. I mean, there's no, I, I really don't think it has any geogra geographical, I guess would be the uh, term, representation that shows up in the neural one now um, visualization. Yeah, I I saw one when when we were in when we were putting this together in in London. I saw I saw it come up, so it exists, okay. but not. Um, but we what we need is for him to explain the steps to get to see it. So um, I I would suggest we um, put that on the list and point it at him and okay. tell us that. Alright. So the idea is. Is of course that should be the that should be the combination of the muscle model that we have as a separate project and right. connectome, and it'd be really good to have a neuroconstruct project uh, like that. And so I think it's I think what it is is just one cylinder right now, as opposed to all of the detail that went into that muscle model. So it may still not be fully complete, but I did see at least just the one cylinder representing the the muscle. We should, we should build on that. Well, and then the question, we beg the question, how deep of a representation do we want to get? I mean, because we know the muscles have muscle arms, uh, and that also plays directly into the simulation as far as how um, ions are propagated down the muscle arms, things like that. So, I don't know. Personally, I'd like to get to a place where we can take what we have currently, consolidate it, and run it in a neuron to start with. Um, with uh, the muscle cell model and with the uh, synapse positions that we're putting in now with the um, with the motor neurons that feed into that one muscle cell so that we um, we can actually play with parameters you know, in, a, in real time. And then from there move to more complexity um, just so that we kind of like can 
to get to a, a milestone with uh, with the simulation work that goes outside of the muscle would be my preference. Uh, okay. Thanks. Very good. I sent a note to you actually to get together on the database stuff because um, I'm very interested in working with you on that. Um, so let's uh, find a time in the next few days. Great. Great. Um, all right. Look at all of you and see. Ask the question. Did I leave any? Did I leave any of you out? No, I did not. Um, so, um, so we've got a little bit of time. Uh, Pedro, I know that uh, you've, you've been listening here, and, and also um, I, I, I know that uh, English is the first language, but do you want to say anything to the group at all uh, uh, before we leave here, just to say hi, or um, you know, what you thought about the project here over the last uh, few weeks? It, um, is it Gaston? I'm sorry. Gaston, yes. <laughs> I <guess> yes. <laughs> yeah. You, the one in the room. Gaston, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> you want to say hi or anything? Mm. Um, my English is, is, is very bad, and I understand so so. Okay. That's okay. Um, uh, <laughs> Most of us have been there, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> That's not a problem. Um, um, we will, we will, uh, the good thing is, is that uh, code is the universal language. And uh, so um, the, the work that uh, you've been doing already is, is um, sort of speaks for itself. So. Um, we will leave. Uh, we will leave saying hi till for another point. But, um, but uh, it's really great to to have your, your help on board, and, um, and I wanted to give you a chance to join in the group uh, as you like um, on this meeting to kind of see all the faces. And, uh, get so. Okay, so you and I will will chat later, um, and um, I see Andre back. So. Great. Uh, does anybody else have any topics to bring up here? Uh, yes, Steven. Yes. Yes. Um, CNS. Yes. Who, so uh, I know Porig probably already booked uh, uh, his hotel for uh, those four or five days, I don't remember, in uh, June for CNS. Uh, I have, sorry? I think it's June. I think it's June. Wait. Late June, Mike says. Uh, when I see CNS 2013 Paris, uh, I see CNS 2013 Paris July 13th through 18th. So is it a different? Uh, no, not that I know of. Okay, then it's July. Okay. So, okay. Just, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> July, yes. What about what about? Uh, uh, so uh, I don't know if we uh, want to put something uh, together or to at least have a rough idea of who would be going so that uh, because I can vote for myself, but then maybe we're all scattered all over Paris, which is maybe not ideal. So uh, I invite. Isn't there <coughs> This CNS, CNS normally has a sort of a student place, a university where they just put people up. Uh, well, I asked Porik this very same question, and so they have lodging info on their website. Okay, there is either hotel booking or student rooms. I see. Okay. And uh, Borg was telling me that maybe the first one was fully booked, uh, and then also another one he tried was fully booked, uh, and then he ended up with the third one. I can actually find uh, which one is it very quickly. So let me just ask. So Andre, are you are you coming to this? Is it confirmed? 
Well, I think he's muted. Okay, now. There you go. Microphone. Um, I have a probability to visit uh, this. Um, probability? I'm well, uh, I, I'm going, but uh, it depends on many factors. Um, so, possibly with some probability, uh, I will be here if. Uh, okay. Let's send this. Be okay. Can we send this around as a thread, Mateo, to organize the. Uh, yeah. No, I just wanted to tell people to start thinking about it. Yeah. How much is the registration, by the way? Uh, I don't know. I haven't registered myself yet. Anybody know? Okay. Airbnb. <laughs> That's a that's an awesome suggestion, actually. Yeah. Fifty. Uh, that's fine. Yeah, that could be that could be good. All right, let's. About, about two years ago, me and a few other people just rented a flat with Airbnb for like a week, and it was great. Yeah, I've I've known folks who do that in, in meetings before. It's a popular thing to do. So, okay. Okay, I'm, I'm creating a thread right now. Uh, okay, thanks, Steve. By the way, um, am I right? Um, there will be uh, one uh, poster uh, from all open world community. So we are going to be there to present uh, it uh, and to, to meet together. So, uh, is it okay um, to go there uh, just to present one poster? Uh, is it uh, normal for such kind of... Andre, <laughs> yes. it's, uh, it's just me and you presenting the poster, so... <laughs> <laughs> so we're, uh, I mean, officially at least, we're the only... It's us presenting the poster, so... So it's not that, yeah. Mateo will be there, and and if there's that many people together, I'm gonna try to find a way to go there. He's, so it may snowball potentially. So sending us. So Borg will be there, right? So we might want to send us on a way to get more. Books. But yeah, in terms of who's officially presenting the poster, it's it's uh, it's just me and Andre. I think Andre is first author on the poster, and uh, I'm second author. So yeah, then yeah. that's that's completely fine. And then if there's that many people there, we might as well not just go just for the meeting, but we should go to also like all of us together. And, you know, Paris is a okay city. It's a really good conference, actually. It's a really fantastic conference. Cool. All right, great. So anything else? Anything to order? All right. Thanks, guys. Uh, obviously, uh, have a look out for the email. I hope you guys can make it on the 21st for the John White thing. I'm really, really excited to, uh, to meet everybody, and, uh, and I'm excited to have him. Uh, and, um, uh, so mark your calendars. All right. Uh, thanks, everybody, and we will meet again in two weeks. Okay. 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 Thanks, everyone. Okay. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.